The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Brian Lynn tells us about the closure of nuclear plants in Germany. John Russell presents a new Everyday Grammar Report. We close with the next part in our American History series, The Making of a Nation. But first... For most of his life, Li Jingwei did not know his birth name. He did not know where he was born or even his exact birthday. That changed last month when he found his biological family with the help of a map. Li was a victim of child trafficking. In 1989, when he was four years old, a neighbor told him that he would take him to look at cars. Cars were rare in the rural Chinese village where Li's family lived. That was the last time he saw his home, Li said. The neighbor took him behind a hill to a road where three bicycles and four other kidnappers were waiting. He cried, but they put him on a bicycle and rode away. I wanted to go home, but they didn't allow that, Lee recently told reporters with the Associated Press. Two hours later, I knew I wouldn't be going back home, and I must have met bad people. He remembers being taken on a train. Later, he was sold to a family in another province in China, Henan. Because I was too young, only four, I hadn't gone to school yet, I couldn't remember anything, including the names of his parents and hometown, he said. He still had strong memories, however, of his village and its surroundings in Yunnan province. He remembers the mountains, bamboo forests, and a small body of water next to his home. He used to play in those places. After he was kidnapped, Lee drew maps of his village every day until he was thirteen. He did this so that he would not forget such details. Before he started school, he would draw the maps on the ground. After entering school, he drew them in his notebooks. For him, drawing the maps became an obsession, something he spent an extraordinary amount of time doing and thinking about. More than 30 years after Lee was taken, one of his detailed maps helped police find his village and his family. He decided to try to find his biological family last year, after he saw two families reunited on the news. In July, a Chinese father was reunited with his son after searching for 24 years. In December, another father was reunited with his kidnapped son after 14 years. Child kidnappings happen regularly in China, although it is unclear how often they happen. The problem was worsened by restrictions that, until 2015, permitted most families living in cities to have only one child. Li decided to speak with his adoptive parents to get more information. He also looked at DNA databases but he found nothing helpful. Then, volunteers suggested that he publish a video of himself on Douyin, a social media service, along with a map he drew from memory. 
It took him only ten minutes to redraw what he had drawn hundreds or thousands of times as a child, he said. Li's post on Doyin was seen tens of thousands of times. By then, Li said, police had already narrowed down possible villages based on his DNA sample. His hand-drawn map helped villagers identify a family. Lee finally connected with his mother over the telephone. She asked about a scar on his chin. She explained the mark was caused by a fall from a ladder. When she mentioned the scar, I knew it was her, Lee said. Other details and memories fell into place, and a DNA test confirmed Lee had found his family. In an emotional reunion on New Year's Day, he saw his mother for the first time since he was four. As Lee walked toward her, he collapsed on the ground in emotion. Lifted up by his younger brother and sister, he finally hugged his mother. Lee began to cry when speaking about his father, who is no longer alive. Lee, who has two children of his own, said he will take his family to visit the place where his father is buried. He plans to go there with all his aunts and uncles during Lunar New Year celebrations next month. It's going to be a real big reunion, Lee said. I want to tell him that his son is back. Germany has closed three of its remaining six nuclear power stations. The move brings the country one step closer to its goal of closing all its nuclear power centers by the end of 2022. Operations at the three stations, or plants, were halted on December 31st. All the stations were first powered up in the mid-1980s. One of them, the Brokdorf plant, sits about 40 kilometers northwest of Hamburg on the Elbe River. In the past, the site was often hit by anti-nuclear protests fueled by the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster in the Soviet Union. The other plants closed last week were Gronda, about 40 kilometers south of Hanover, and Gund Remingen, which is 80 kilometers west of Munich. The country's three remaining nuclear power plants are to stop operations by the end of 2022. The German government decided to speed up its withdrawal from nuclear power after Japan's Fukushima reactor accident in 2011. That accident, caused by an earthquake and huge ocean waves, resulted in the world's worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. Some in Germany have called on the government to reconsider its decision to end nuclear power. Supporters of the technology argue that it can help Germany meet its climate targets for reducing levels of greenhouse gases. But the government said recently that closing the nuclear plants and ending coal use by 2030 will not affect the country's energy security or its goal of making the economy climate neutral by 2045. Germany's energy industry group, BDEW, 
estimated the six nuclear power plants produced about 12% of the country's electricity in 2021. The share of renewable energy was nearly 41%, while coal was 28%. Gas production amounted to about 15 percent. Germany aims to make renewables meet 80 percent of power demand by 2030 through expanding wind and solar power equipment. The mayor of Gundremingen, Tobias Bühler, was asked about possible job losses at the town's plant. He told Reuters that the center's employees would be busy taking apart the nuclear reactor after the shutdown. And this period of dismantling will certainly take another one or two decades, Bühler said. Germany's nuclear power companies will receive nearly $3 billion for the early closures of the plants. Environment Minister Steffi Lemke has dismissed suggestions that a new generation of nuclear power plants might persuade Germany to reconsider its decision. Nuclear power plants remain high-risk facilities that produce highly radioactive atomic waste, Lemke told the Funke Media Group. A final decision has not been made about where to store tens of thousands of tons of nuclear waste produced by German power plants. Experts say some material will remain dangerously radioactive for many generations. I'm Brian Lynn. Imagine someone asks you if you can speak English. You could say, I can speak English. Or you could say, I can't speak English. In today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore the connection between grammar and speaking. You will learn about small details in these two statements that can teach you a lot about American English. In particular, you will learn about how auxiliary verbs are used in everyday speech. But first... Let's start with a few important terms and ideas. In English, we generally divide words into one of two types, content words and function words. Content words include nouns, adjectives, and verbs. These words are often stressed, meaning said louder or in a higher pitch in everyday speech. Function words are words that have a grammatical purpose. Function words include pronouns, prepositions, determiners, and auxiliary verbs. These words are less central to expressing exact meaning. For this reason, they are generally not stressed in everyday speaking. There are important exceptions, however, as we will see. You might be asking yourself, the following question. What is the connection between word stress, auxiliary verbs, and the example sentences from the beginning of this report? The answer is this. Although auxiliary verbs are generally not stressed in their positive form, they are often stressed in their negative form. The negative form is a statement that expresses denial, disagreement, inability, or refusal. Think back to the example you heard at the beginning of this report. I can speak English. Note that the content words such as speak and English are stressed. Note that the auxiliary verb can is not stressed. It is in its so-called weak form. The normal form sounds like this. Can. 
the weak form sounds like this, kun. The difference is in the vowel sound. Now listen to our other example sentence. I can't speak English. This has the negative form of can, can't, which is short for cannot. Our statement could have been, I cannot speak English. Note that in both sentences with the negative auxiliary, can't or cannot, there is stress on the auxiliary verb. Let's listen again to our affirmative sentence with the unstressed auxiliary and our negative sentence with the stressed auxiliary. I can speak English. I can't speak English. The general idea in today's report is that Americans generally stress auxiliary verbs in their negative forms. They generally do not stress auxiliary verbs when they are in their positive forms. This idea holds for all kinds of auxiliary verbs, could, should, would, and so on. The next time you listen to Americans speak, pay careful attention to how they use auxiliary verbs, both in negative and positive forms. With time and careful study, you will become much more confident in how you use and pronounce auxiliary verbs. I'm John Russell. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. The war between the United States and Spain in 1898 was one of the shortest in American history. The fighting lasted about three months. Yet that short war led to long-term changes for America. Victory made the United States an increasingly important world power. Larry West and Shep O'Neill tell about those developments. The United States received several of Spain's island colonies as part of the peace agreement. The most important was the Philippines. Many Americans thought the United States should not have overseas territories. But President William McKinley thought the Philippines were unprepared for independence. He decided to keep the islands and prepare the people for self-government in the future. A Filipino nationalist group led by Emilio Aguinaldo rejected American control. Aguinaldo declared the formation of a Philippine Republic, and he started a guerrilla war against the occupying forces. The rebellion in the Philippines became a major issue in America's presidential election of 1900. The Republican Party renominated William McKinley as president. And it nominated a hero of the Spanish-American War, New York Governor Theodore Roosevelt, as vice president. The Democratic Party, for the second time, nominated Congressman William Jennings Bryan as president. It nominated a former vice president, Adlai Stevenson, as vice president again. William Jennings Bryan campaigned against the American takeover of the Philippines. He received support from a new group, the Anti-Imperialist League. Members included leading American politicians, businessmen, and writers. President McKinley did not campaign much. He let vice presidential candidate Theodore Roosevelt do it. Roosevelt spoke of America's success as a new economic and political power in the world. He said the Republican Party was responsible. The majority of voters liked what Roosevelt said. They elected the Republican candidates. 
the Republican victory destroyed the hopes of many nationalists in the Philippines. With William McKinley in the White House again, they saw little chance of gaining independence. Nationalist leader Emilio Aguinaldo, however, refused to surrender. As long as he remained free, the guerrilla war would continue. For months, American forces tried without success to find him. Finally, with the help of a tribe of Filipino mercenary soldiers called the Macabebe Scouts, they captured him. Aguinaldo signed an agreement to support the United States. With this agreement, the rebellion ended on the island of Luzon, but it continued for more than a year in the southern Philippines. Hostilities ended officially on July 4, 1902. American occupation of the Philippines made the United States a major power in the Far East. As such, it began to develop new policies toward Asia, especially a new policy toward China. Americans had been trading with China for years, but not heavily. As the American economy grew, however, businessmen saw China with a population of 400 million people as a great market for American products. Other countries were interested in this market, too. Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and Russia all claimed special rights in parts of China. They began to divide the country into areas called spheres of influence. It seemed these areas could become foreign colonies. Then the United States would be cut off from trading directly with China. To prevent that from happening, American Secretary of State John Hay proposed what became known as the Open Door Policy. Secretary Hay asked the nations involved to agree to equal trading rights for all countries in all parts of China. No nation, he said, should interfere with the rights or powers of any other nation in China. No one welcomed the proposal, but no one rejected it either. Most of the nations involved said they agreed with the idea but they said they could not approve it unless everyone else did. Secretary Hay refused to wait for them to act. So in May 1900, he announced that all the nations involved had given their approval to the open-door policy. The new policy was tested very soon, Within a month of Hay's announcement, violence broke out against foreigners in China. The attacks were led by a secret group called Righteous Harmonious Fists. Foreigners called its members Boxers. Boxers hated all foreign influence in China. They organized in areas where foreign influence was strongest. They killed Christian missionaries and Chinese who had accepted the Christian religion. They also destroyed foreign industries, especially railroads. The Chinese government in Beijing supported the Boxer Rebellion. It permitted the Boxers to occupy the capital. The rebellion lasted about two months. It ended when an allied force of American, British, French, German, and Japanese soldiers reached Beijing and ended the Boxer occupation. The foreign powers began to negotiate with China 
on paying for damages. The United States was worried about the results. It believed some of the nations involved would use the Boxer Rebellion as a way to gain more control over Chinese territory. Secretary of State Hay quickly announced America's policy on the issue. The United States, he said, wanted a settlement which would bring peace and safety to China. The settlement must protect China's territorial rights so it would not be divided into foreign colonies. Britain and Germany agreed. With their help, Secretary Hay got the others to accept money, not territory, as payment for damages. The final settlement forced China to pay $333 million. The United States used some of its share to pay for the education of Chinese students in America. The results of the Boxer Rebellion and the Spanish-American War made clear that the new century would have a new world power, the United States. And this new power had a president with the political skills to do the job, William McKinley. In September 1901, President McKinley made a major foreign policy speech at the Pan American Fair in Buffalo, New York. He spoke about the importance and the promise of America's new position in the world. The next day, President McKinley went to the fair's Temple of Music. He planned to spend several hours meeting the public and shaking hands. A young man waited in line to see him. When the young man stepped in front of McKinley... McKinley reached out to shake his hand. Two shots rang out from a gun the man had hidden under a cloth. One of the bullets struck McKinley in the stomach. The president was taken to an emergency hospital on the fairgrounds. He was not conscious. The bullet had damaged his stomach, pancreas, and one kidney, but doctors did not believe he was in danger of dying. The man who shot McKinley was Leon Cholgosh. Cholgosh was an anarchist. He believed all rulers were enemies of the people. He believed the people had the right to kill them. Cholgosh also was mentally ill. He had tried to join several anarchist groups. They refused to accept him, however, because of his mental condition. After shooting President McKinley, Cholgosh explained why he had done it. He said it was not right for one man to receive so much public honor while he received none. For two days, the president remained in a coma. Then his condition changed. He regained consciousness and was able to talk. He rested and became stronger. Then the president's condition changed again. An infection developed in his wound. It spread throughout his body. In another few days, he was dead. Vice President Roosevelt hurried to Buffalo. He went to the house where the president's body lay. Then he went to another house to be sworn in as president. He was 42 years old, the youngest man ever to hold the office. Roosevelt declared that the administration would go on as before. It is my aim, he said, to continue unbroken the policy of President McKinley for the peace, the prosperity, and the honor of our beloved country. 
And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan.